Robin Harris is going to give us a presentation on security engine, which is developed by um, Robert, uh, Robert Burke, right? Doug Burke. Doug Burke. Doug Burke. The next. Yeah, Doug Burks, who lives in Augusta, and he actually came and gave a presentation on, for those that don't know what security engine is, Robert will explain it to us. And, and I, I'm actually setting up a research server, RAC, okay. to test an environment, how, how it scales and everything else. So, really so well, you'll, know how to, you'll know how to run it after this. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming out. Uh, I did end up bringing two tables of people here with me today. So, Yay! This is one of my favorite quotes here. Just wanted everybody to take a look at this before we got started. And I've I've loved this for years, and I think especially with the news that has come out here this month, this is just proving to be more and more true. For those of us in the back, you read it out loud. And for sure. those of us who are on the other side of the internet. So this is a quote from, from Gene Spafford. It says, the only truly secure system is one that is powered off cast in a block of concrete, and sealed in a lead-lined room with armed guards. And even then, I have my doubts. So again, I just always loved this. And uh, it's just every week, every month, proves more and more to be to be true. So I am going to present to you guys. Uh, I've got a lot of information in here about Security Onion and kind of how I got to the point of where I wanted to, to run Security Onion. So um, I'm going to go through this. If you have a question during it, just go ahead and shout it out. I'll be more than happy to answer your question if I know how. Uh, if not, just make up an answer. Yeah, I'll just make up, I'll just make up answers here. So no problem with that. So just a little bit about me. I'm not going to sit here and read to you guys today, but just put some information up here. I have got a lot of hobbies, a lot of things that I'm into. You name it, I've probably done it or, or, or still do it. From a uh, work perspective, I do work for Dell Secure Works. I'm a, a trusted advisor for them, which is a senior security advisor position. And basically, I'm a dedicated resource for I work with a team of folks. We are the uh, dedicated resources for basically our top 75 clients. And I'm responsible for service delivery for them, kind of their single point of contact into the company. So starting out with computers, first computer I ever touched was a Tandy 6000. had dual 8-inch floppy drives. Um, done a lot with that. My first laptop, TRS-80 Model 100. Right here. This thing worked up until about two years ago, and I'm kind of pissed that it uh, doesn't work anymore. So. I tinker with a lot of stuff. I fit that classical definition of a hacker. I like to take stuff that's not necessarily meant for something and try and make it do something else in there. So um, I, I like a lot of old technologies too. You guys have seen me with my uh, Captain Crunch whistles. So I've, I've tinkered and toyed with, with just about everything that's out there. Um, a little bit about my educational background, some other stuff that I've done. Real big into ham radio. Uh, started doing that when I was about 15 years old. And um, I put some interests that I have down here, and I had to really truncate this list. There were about 20 <laughs> things that I did not put on there, and about a half a dozen other groups that I participate in that I just I didn't want to make this like 10 slides. So um, we're going to take a look here, starting off with taking a look at Snort, and we'll see how that plays into Security Onion and what's that up, that's all about. Getting Snort up and running. Uh, how to set up Security Onion at home. We're actually going to take a look at it in action, some use cases, um, and actually do a little bit of uh, looking at some sample events and things like that, and some questions and answers. So uh, I take the work that I do real seriously, but I don't take myself real seriously, so I like to joke and have a lot of fun. So uh, lots of fun and humor, pictures uh, at work to kind of break the monotony sometimes. I'll respond to emails as a haiku. And uh, I've included some security haiku on here as we go into our transition, so those are kind of fun. And links to click on. Now, with this being a hacking group, I'm going to make these slides available. Please, please, please vet these links before you edit them. <laughs> Don't just start clicking on links. I'm sitting here telling you there's everything in here is legit, but. Please Stop have some, sus some, some suspicion to yourself and, and, and don't just trust what I say. Please vet the information that I provide. Oh, and that was me just trolling AT&T on Facebook. So um, look at Snort. 
my first security haiku here. Please take this survey, suspicious LinkedIn email, click it anyway. <laughs> so a lot of you may have heard of Snort, and this whole presentation originally started as a work presentation. I wanted to go through and start using some technologies that I deal with through my clients at work, starting to, to do some of those things at, at home. So, like for example, our February presentation by Adric, one of the things he was uh, putting forth was that you really should have a security lab at home. And so I know several of us out here have that set up. I do that. I've got all kinds of hardware all over the place. Running, you name it, uh, it's running somewhere at my house. So I wanted to get Snort up and running here, and this was kind of my journey uh, through that. So we know uh, Snort is kind of the core of an IDS, IPS system. Um, it started as open source. It is still open source, freely available, and uh, Sourcefire does keep up with it here now. So it is the core of actual Sourcefire technologies. So one of the neat things is you don't have to spend six figures on a source fire sensor and defense center. Uh, you can you can grab it yourself. So when you're going through running Snort, just the very core of it, there's two basic things that you've got to have. You've got to have the Snort engine, and you've got to have your your Snort rules. And there's a couple of sources of those rules, and I'm going to show you a few of the few of the major sources for those rules. So why do you want to run it? Well, for me, it was couple of things on here. It's something fun I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to learn more about Sourcefire. I had a lot of clients who run that technology and I want to be able to watch what's going on on my own network. So uh, in, in a previous life I uh, worked for a company and about 5% of the time we were doing uh, Ethernet cabling as well as fiber optic uh, uh, installs of fusion splicing. And so I've always been real interested in what's going on kind of down at at the lower layers of, of the stack here. And um, I really wanted to be able to watch that and see what's exactly going on across the network. And this is a good way, too, to learn protocols, is being able to watch what's going on and then kind of reverse engineer it and figure it out so that you, oh, I've seen this. I know what this means. So many of you may recognize the Snort the Pig mascot. So I took this picture at one of the, the Source Fire uh, lunches that they did. And uh, they, they gave you the uh, little squishy pigs while you're out there. Uh, a lot of people may recognize the Snort the Pig mascot from their calendars are pretty popular. Um, but uh, that, that is uh, Snort. That is his name. Now, on the other hand, this is not Snort the Pig. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, this is uh, my friend Roberta down in Nicaragua. That was a pig that I uh, took in the back of a pickup truck from a farm at the base of a volcano called San Cristobal out to the middle of nowhere in Nicaragua and uh, delivered this to, to the family out there. So that's Roberta, not Snort. Don't get them confused. Is Roberta still alive? I don't know. It's a, uh, was Roberta lunch? Uh, she was not supposed to be. So Roberta was pregnant. And actually, about an hour after we dropped Roberta off, she gave birth to six piglets. Um, so all. I, I don't know who is bacon, but I'm hoping it was not Roberta because I got to name her. So, um, Never name your food. That's correct. Well, it's she's Delicious. quite some ways away, but uh, maybe I'll see her again this October when I go back. So to, to run Snort, um, there's some real basic system requirements that you're going to want to have in terms of hardware. Uh, you want about three gigs of RAM minimum. Uh, typically, the, the, the standard is you will see it listed as two gigs for your OS and then one gig for every network that you're going to um, to watch. So if you're going to watch multiple networks, uh, add one gig for each network you're going to watch. However, for stuff like home-based uh, traffic, unless you're doing something crazy at home, uh, you really don't need a whole heck of a lot of RAM. Uh, if you want to keep your PCAPs, you're going to want a lot of drive space. That will fill it very quickly because think about it, if you're sitting there watching streaming Netflix, you're just going to be sitting there writing to disk nonstop. Two NICs. This is really important. You're going to have one NIC that's going to have an IP address assigned to it. And you're going to use that for your management. And then the other NIC is not going to have an IP address assigned to it. You're going to be watching it in promiscuous mode. 
and that's what's actually going to be sniffing the traffic off of the network. Uh, you can run it under Windows or Linux. I highly recommend Linux, but there is a Windows version available for it. So your uh, network requirements. There's a couple of different ways that you can get a feed off of your network. One of them is if you're just interested in watching your ingress egress traffic at your um, at your uh, for your WAN link, is you can use a simple tap like this. Um, this is one that I used. You'll see it later in the presentation. Um, it's just a kit. It's about fifteen dollars, and that's the throwing star land tap. And I just soldered this together and assembled it. And it, it worked perfectly for me. Uh, another method uh, that you can use is these are really hard to find. But this is a 10100 hub. This is not a switch. This is a hub. So think of it as a multi-port repeater. Anything that it sees on one port, it's going to retransmit on all of the ports. So this is real good to say put in between a cable or DSL modem and your firewall or router, and you can watch all your WAN traffic uh, that way. So this is really old, hard to find. Uh, if you find one of these and come across a garage sale for two bucks, buy it. <laughs> One, one place I found that you can find things like that are like these small computer repair shops. Sure. Because they tend to, I guess, with their customers, and when they go and replace hubs and switches, they'll take the hubs. And usually you can get one for like 10 to 15 bucks. Right. Yeah, that's actually how I got this one was a company I was working for. This one was um, at a network drop at a desk that had a laser printer there as well, and they wanted that removed, so that's where this came from. I also discovered there's a great little device uh, called the LandTap Pro. I got mine from BaseHacker.com. <laughs> <laughs> no way! <laughs> it's amazing. Great. They sell these little LandTap Pros. This is a little unpowered uh, $40 LandTap. They're also pretty useful. <laughs> nice, nice plug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, the other way that you can get a feed off here, this is the, the method that I do it for my actual LAN, is by having a managed switch that is capable of either doing port mirroring or spanning. Uh, it's the same technology, just depends on the vendor. Um, so this is the actual switch that I use at home. It's a gigabit switch, and it will go through, and I've got everything mirrored off to a single port that feeds into uh, my IDS box. Oh, sorry, I'm going back up. All right, so uh, running with Snort. Uh, let me get this right. Your web server is pretty secure. PCAP says it's not. We run into that a lot at work. Um, seeing data exfiltrated from a network, and uh, somebody says, no, 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 it's, it's not vulnerable to that. Well, here's a PCAP of your data leaving. Absolutely it is. Uh, so to get Snort, if you just want the Snort engine and the rules by itself, you can go to snort.org. There's a real simple registration you can do there. You can download the Snort engine, again, either for Windows or for Linux, or there, there's other mixed varieties. Uh, and then you can also download the Snort VRT rules that we're going to talk about here. So the VRT rules that you can get from Snort, they're created by Sourcefire's Vulnerability Research Team. That's what VRT stands for. So these are the same rules that go out to the Sourcefire uh, customers. There's a little bit of a difference, though, with the way that you can get these rule sets. If you want a 30-day delayed rule set, you can get that for free. Or if you want a paid rule set, which is current and up-to-date, there's a um, paid subscription for individuals, 30 bucks a year, or if it's being used for business, $4.99. Um, they're excellent rule sets. These have been well vetted. Uh, occasionally, there's something in there that's a little bit chatty, but uh, they, they take uh, great care in producing these rule sets. Uh, there's also a, uh, this is real important, there's a Perl script called Pull the Fork, which you can use to keep your rule sets up to date and it works on multiple different rule sets. Um, if you're going to use uh, pulled pork, you need something called an OINT code, which is just a real long hexadecimal code. When you register at snort.org, you get that OINT code for free. You're going to need that if you're going through and setting up Security Onion, so be sure you save that. 
one of the nice things about Snort and the rule sets is you can go through, create your own custom rules if there's something in particular that you're interested in. You're real good with regex or protocols. Uh, you can disable rules completely if it's something you're not interested in seeing. And you can also tune the rules to turn out some noise and rewrite a particular signature that you just don't like the way that it works. There's also another rule set called the Emerging Threats uh, rule set. And this used to be called uh, Bleeding Threats, uh, if you've ever heard that term used for, for Snort rule sets. Uh, they have two different ways to get it. There's a free one called ET Open, and then there is a ET Pro set that's sold as a subscription base for 500 a year or 1350 for three years. Uh, I use the ET Open, the free rule set. It is really noisy. The vast majority <laughs> of the hits that you're going to get are going to come from that. The majority of the rules that I've ever either disabled or tuned out were the ET Open rule set. So be careful when, when using those. Uh, when I fired up my first sensor, in the first 15 minutes, I had like 17,000 alerts in there. And about 16,990 of them were from one particular really poorly written rule. So you'll, you'll see that one here in a little bit. You can use this rule set in conjunction with the VRT rule set. Uh, basically, it assigns uh, a signature ID. And so there's different ranges for different rule sets so that they don't overlap. Uh, there are other rule sets out there. There's like a Snort Community rule set. You can create your own rules to use in there, and they'll all run concurrently with each other. Um, it's got a little bit of a reputation for having some weak signatures that aren't necessarily field tested or all that well vetted. So again, just be careful if you're going to use the emerging threats rule sets. Did the old, so, uh, the old White Hats rule set go away when MacVision went to jail? Does that, does that still exist? That I don't know. I haven't seen that. So what is the main difference between the two, VRT and the uh, these ones? So the, VR, the VRT rule set uh, is going to be some of the more more serious uh, type stuff to watch out for. A lot of what you see in the ET uh, rule sets are, hey, this might be interesting to you, but it's not necessarily security relevant. Uh, there's also some event preprocessing rules that run with Snort that show you things like protocol errors. And every one of them that I've looked into, it's just something, somebody didn't write the protocol correctly, and the event preprocessing rules caught it in Snort. So you'll see, they, they're usually the uh, the event summary starts with stream five, and most of those I've just, I've just turned off because I've just determined they're 100% complete noise to me. So um, I would just consider the, the uh, maybe starting with the VRT rule set, uh, it's not going to show you a whole heck of a lot unless there's, unless there's something more serious going on. The ET open or the, the ET rule sets are going to show you everything you want to see and then some. So <clears throat> from the uh, ET open rule set, right? So, so have you looked at the possibility, let's say, it says this protocol is maybe not implemented well for some client in the network. So I mean, did you like at any time try to analyze it, that, analyze it and see if that can be exploited on that particular client? Which is not using that protocol well, or like some. If someone's not following the protocol, the chances are more than likely that there is some type of a vulnerability there that could be exploited. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked into it in, in that fashion. I just thought, well, this is somebody being lazy and sloppy. Okay. Let me go back one. Um, all right, so Snort by itself, as I started doing this research on it to get it up and running, I found Snort by itself just really isn't all that useful sitting there by itself. There's a whole bunch of other uh, scripts, a whole bunch of other, uh, well, databases, uh, other software that you really want to run with Snort in order to get the full value out of it. This is not a comprehensive list. There are a lot more things, but these are the big ones that you're going to see uh, typically running with Snort to be able to actually work with the events in there. So Snort just, just watches the, uh, the PCAPs coming off of the wire, compares it against the rule sets, and then makes a decision whether there's a match, generally based off of the regex, uh, and then uh, fires off an alert. So you're going to want somewhere a database to store the alerts in, and then some other tools to go through and be able to view those alerts, and then also some analysis tools to go through and watch those things. So like, for example, Wireshark really good one to go through and view those PCAPs. Once you see an alert, there's something interesting you want to watch. And I'll show you how to how to pull those out. 
So I started, when I was going through it, I said, okay, I can get Snore, and I can go and get all this other support software, and I can kind of build all this stuff up, and maybe in a week I'll have a, have a nice working IDS sensor. And then I found out about Security Onion. And the, the work that it probably would have taken me a week, you know, in the evenings to go through and pull all this together, Security Onion pulls that together for you and gets that all configured in about two and a half minutes. So I thought, oh, well, there's a little bit easier way to do this. So I started researching uh, Security Onion. Um, we mentioned earlier Doug Burks out in Augusta did create this. Uh, it's based off of Ubuntu. It runs uh, Zubuntu. Um, and you can download an ISO from them that's a live CD and it's got an installer built into it. Or if you want to run your own favorite Ubuntu distribution, you can also download it as a package and run it that way if you don't want to use their, their live CD where everything's all, all in one. Um, I use PuTTY and manage it over SSH uh, myself. Uh, there's the, the box I've got it running on is completely headless. Um, I just SSH into it to do everything that I need to do. Um, I guess it was, was it Thursday? Ubuntu 14.04 was released. Um, so I think it was Wednesday. It was either Wednesday or Thursday. It's really recent. Yeah, it was Thursday. Yeah. Um, probably, so obviously there isn't a 14.04 version. This is based off of the 12.04 LTS uh, version. <laughs> you could dump the packages, load up you, the You could do that. Minutes, and Absolutely. 20 minutes. So um, now that I've gone through and done my research and decided that Security Onion is something I really want to want to work with here for my Snort platform, it's really kind of the way that I think of it. Uh, here's how you uh, you get that up and running, and uh, this is one I, I deal with a lot at work. So PCI irks me. This will cost money for sure. Retain all the logs. <coughs> so my home network. Um, <laughs> I've just got kind of a description here. I'll let you guys read, read through that. I'm not going to read off the list to you. But um, uh, I, I run a lot of different different platforms at home. I've got a lot of, a lot of different hardware that I've got up and running. And, um, uh, you know, again, I just like to tinker with, you name it, I probably got it running somewhere uh, just, just to see what I can actually make this stuff do. Um, how do you troubleshoot uh, this? Uh, scissors. <laughs> Very carefully. Very carefully. So I, I started off, I wanted to kind of build a security server to be able to use that as a platform for launching um, Security Onion on here. So I've got some, some uh, older Dell <laughs> hardware, still got a little bit of horsepower to it. Real nice, fast, 15,000 RPM SAS drives. Uh, enough RAM. I meet the uh, dual NICs here. I've got dual gigabit NICs on that box. Um, I put Windows Server 2008 R2 on there because I wanted to use Hyper-V. I've got a lot of experience with Hyper-V, uh, so I just, that's the reason I decided to, to go that particular route. And I've just got this guy running down in my garage here. Yeah. So, yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah, it's bad. So I go through and I install my, my OS, and like any good security practitioner, I run my updates here. <laughs> Maybe hard to see. 119 updates was the first round that I went through, so went through the pain of letting that cook for hours and hours and hours. And this was, again, just the prerequisites for about five more rounds of, of, uh, of updates on there. I've got my dual gigabit NICs on the back of that power edge box there. So this, uh, I don't know why they don't do it zero and one, but it's one and two. So port one here was my management interface. And then I have my sniffing interface here. Both of these patch cables go straight to my switch. Now inside, this is a managed switch that I use. I found this buried under administration, diagnostics, port, and VLAN monitoring. It took me a few minutes to find that buried in there. I knew the switch did it, uh, but for some reason it was under diagnostics in there. So I went through and uh, did set that up. Gigabit Ethernet port 2, 
is uh, going to source all my VLAN 1 traffic and dump it out and mirror all of my traffic on that port. So that's one of the switch ports that's going to my dual NIC on that box. So I wanted to verify and make sure that that was in fact working, uh, just kind of taking it layer by layer, making sure that that NIC was in fact seeing all of that traffic that it should be. So I download Wireshark and uh, pop that on the box. And sure enough, I am seeing unicast traffic on that box, on that port, uh, that was not destined for that particular box. So in this case, this was my uh, ex-wife watching Netflix. I recognize this RFC 1918 IP as being the box that was in my living room hooked up to my television. And then I went up and looked up this 108.175 IP, which, which is assigned to, uh, to Netflix there. So I knew that we were good. Uh, I should normally not be seeing this traffic. Uh, but because I'm running Wireshark, I've got the NIC in promiscuous mode, and I have got my uh, switch mirroring all that traffic, I know that I'm good. So you look through here, there, there really isn't any broadcast traffic in here. This is strictly unicast traffic, so I know I'm, I'm set. Just a quick question for the, the switch. Did you plug into the span ports? Yes. Yeah. So from, my, um, from that security server that I built, I just have the management port, which had an IP address assigned to it, just going to any old switch port. And then the second NIC that was on there, that was going to my mirror port. So I went through, I uh, set up the role for Hyper-V on the server, and I went through, got the ISO, and ran through and started doing the security onion uh, uh, setup on here. Again, if you've ever installed Ubuntu, it's just an Ubuntu install with a couple extra little steps on it once the OS is actually installed. It's very easy to do. Uh, I ran through the basic uh, configuration, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more here. And then I started seeing a couple of events show up real quickly. I thought, oh, this is great. This was a piece of cake. I am done uh, with the install on this, but I ran into two particular problems. The first problem that I ran into was I kept trying to generate events uh, or by, by just using like Nmap and trying to generate some traffic for it. And I started looking at the events as they kept popping up, and I noticed something. Look at the destination IP. This is all broadcast traffic here. Hmm. Well, I know when I ran Wireshark, I saw a unicast traffic on my network that was not destined for that box. Uh, but now, for some reason, all I'm seeing is broadcast traffic. Uh, once I'm actually inside of uh, Hyper-V and inside of the V, that's all that I'm able to see, even though I mapped the next. Yeah, don't you have to set the option to allow promiscuous mode on the Well, there is no such thing. Not in Hyper-V. So <laughs> Microsoft calls it a security feature. Who believes that? Um, it does not allow bridging of a promiscuous NIC from a physical NIC into a virtual NIC inside of Hyper-V. It will not let you do it. So I guess the solution is to not use Windows for anything. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> there is a solution there. That is correct. So that was my first problem. So I thought, okay, well, I, I need another hypervisor. So I pick another hypervisor, and then I run into another problem. So I chose VirtualBox. And I got VirtualBox. I'm sorry? You said hypervisor. I chose VirtualBox. <laughs> uh, I got VirtualBox up and running. I had the uh, VT set in the BIOS on this on this particular server. But for some reason, I could not get it to accept a 64-bit OS. Whatever I did could not get it to run a 64-bit OS, even though it's a 64-bit box. Now, I've run... I've run uh, VirtualBox on other 64-bit machines and gotten them to spin up 64-bit OSs, but on this particular box, no matter what I tried, could not get it to run. So this was several hours into it now after running all these Microsoft updates and all this. So I'm getting a little bit frustrated. And I, pop, I popped in. I said, okay, well, it's not going to run a 64-bit OS. Let's put a 32-bit OS on here, and then I'm just going to download the Security Onion package and install that. I said, okay, great. Well, so I fire up Ubuntu 12.04 32-bit, but it also hangs at startup in VirtualBox. So I'm getting even more frustrated here at this point. So I thought they stopped making a 32-bit version of this. I think they dropped the 32-bit support like 
not too long ago. Yeah, at the time I did this, it was still there. They used to. I, I got screwed by VirtualBox about a year ago. Yeah. Where I basically I threw it off my Windows box. Well, I had a problem with with I still do have a problem with running VirtualBox where you go to shut down the machine and it never cleanly shuts down and then it hoses your VHD. It, it yeah. used to be the Ubuntu ones if you enable 3D acceleration. So if you have oh. if you turn off 3D acceleration, I've never tried that on it. I, I spent about four hours yesterday on that. So I'm getting a little frustrated with the problems that I'm having, and luckily I have the ability to clone hardware. So I grabbed another one of the identical servers that I've got. Uh, same thing, 4 gigs of RAM, dual NIC, 15,000 RPM, SAS drives in there, and decided I was going to start over with another box. I didn't want to hose what I had already built just in case I found a, a 10 second fix for it later. I wanted to go and try it again. Well, you're optimistic. <laughs> I am optimistic. Well, you saw the hardware list. I've got no shortage of hardware, so it doesn't pain me to leave that sit there. And your employer has nothing to do with that at all. I'm sorry? And your employer has nothing to do with that at all. No, no, no. Uh, they do not, in fact. Um, so to go through and um, do the install, I found there's a series of 12 videos that Doug Parker put together that's up on YouTube. And I watched that video series to go through and see how he set it up. So, well, I want to see how the guy who made this would go through and kind of his best practices on that. So I've got the URL here. Again, vet that for yourself. Uh, there is a wiki page up here uh, that's got the instructions. They even say on the wiki page that the instructions are dated. And I found the uh, steps I went through on the YouTube playlist was the accurate way to go through and do it with that particular release. So I went through, I took that second server, and I just installed Security Onion on bare metal uh, on that box. I did a big RAID, zero, half a terabyte array uh, on there, and um, I just wanted some performance out of the box. If that array craps out, I can rebuild it pretty quickly. Now, once you've gone through and you follow the install that's in the YouTube video, again, it's just kind of a standard Ubuntu install. The only thing that's really special about that is the time zone. It doesn't matter which time zone you set in there. It's going to default to UTM anyway, so just be wary of that because the first two times I went to install it, I got really frustrated trying to set it at the Eastern time zone, and then it like overwrites it and goes to, to UTC, and um, uh, so that frustrated me quite a bit. But once you've got your OS loaded, you're going to find an icon on the desktop that's the Security Onion Setup Wizard. You go through and you run that wizard, and you've got to do two passes of the setup wizard. The first time you go and set it up, you're going to be configuring your network interfaces. So you're going to be doing your management through your ETH0. Uh, you can give it a static IP address, everything else, all the standard stuff that you, you assign to a NIC. And then you're monitoring ETH1, and then there's no IP address assigned to that. We're just going to be watching it in promiscuous mode. I got that set up. I went through, decided I wanted to generate some, some test network traffic. Uh, I ran speed test a couple of times. Uh, again, the ex-wife was watching Netflix upstairs. You could use iPerf to go through and do that. I just wanted to go through and make sure that that NIC was seeing it uh, on, on the bare metal box, was seeing that traffic. Because I know that the switch works fine. I just want to test my NIC here. And so sure enough, here it is. On ETH1, which is our monitoring interface, RX bytes, 282 megs. This was in the course of a couple of minutes. So yeah, I know that that is working. I know that we're, 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 we're all set on there. Now, the next thing you're going to want to do is there's, uh, this is before you go through and, and actually start configuring your Security Onion um, software on here, is there's a script called SUIT, which stands for Security Onion Updates. If you go through your normal like app get uh, methods of updating Ubuntu, there's a problem with pfring and uh, MySQL in that it'll break if you don't do it in a particular order. So they created this soup script right here, and it will go through and actually update all of your packages in the proper order so stuff does not break. I've never had a problem with running it. Um, every time I SSH into the box, it tells me there's updates. I'll go through and run this. 
and it just works perfectly for me. Never had a single problem with running it. So because this is based on Ubuntu 12.04, it does use the OpenSSL library. So another real good reason that you want to go through and uh, actually go through and run your updates on here. So I ran this on, I think on the 8th was uh, when I did the, uh, the update for it. So you can see here my uh, build date for OpenSSL is April the 7th. 2014, so that's the non-vulnerable version, just as an example on there. And uh, this one was kind of fun, had some fun with this one work. Heartbleed steals my stack, please take my clear text traffic, no bounce check for you. <laughs> so I, the first time we ran the setup wizard on there, we were going through and we were configuring our NICs. The second time you're going to go back and run this again, you run the exact same program, it's going to run through configuring the software on here. Now I followed his YouTube instructions on there. There are some people who may say turn things like row off uh, as it's going through. It uses a lot of resources. When you run top on a box that's running row, it's always way up there. Um, uh, again, don't set the, uh, the time zone. It's going to set it for you. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, that box has four processor cores. I gave it all, all four of those. Uh, again, that point code we talked about earlier, when you're going through, it's going to ask you, do you want to run VRT, do you want to run ET open, or do you want to run both? If you select any option that includes the VRT rules, <coughs> you're going to need that point code to make this work properly. And it feeds that into the config of the full port script, so that when that script runs daily, uh, it's, it's already got the oint code, which is required to actually download uh, your, your VRT rule sets there. Uh, the other thing you're going to do is you're going to set some logins um, during this time. So remember the credential sets that you use while you're going through this setup. Uh, it configures everything for you. The second pass of it, again, takes about two and a half minutes to do. And this is the piece that may be replacing about a week's worth of work to get everything working uh, together properly. Uh, once that wizard completes, that box is up and running. Now the first time you get it up and running, it may take about 10 minutes before it honestly starts processing events. That was in my experience with it. So if you log right into it and you're like, you're not seeing anything in there immediately, um, even if you're trying to generate some, some sample alerts on the box, that's okay. Just give it some time, about 10 minutes, and you'll start seeing stuff popping up on there if you're doing your part of trying to generate some test traffic. And we'll talk about some ways to do that. Um, and for your, your, your starting point in your operations, there's an application. It's a web application called Snorby. Uh, and that's what lets you go in and actually see your alerts uh, that, are, that are coming up. Again, it's part of the support software that you've got to package with Snorby in order to make it actually do something useful for you. So um, going into Snorby, it's got a whole bunch of different features in here. It's actually a pretty impressive interface for the price for it for free. Uh, it'll do a number of things um, for you to go through and be able to manage your events, classify the events that you see firing, uh, resolving them if it's a false positive. You can go through and assign aliases for IP addresses. So if you have something at a, a particular box you want to keep a careful eye on, it'll just pop right out on you. It'll do GOIP uh, in there, so you can see some of your source and desk countries in there. Um, it's got a note section in there that will allow you to go through, and uh, if you're doing some incident response in there, pop your notes in there and go through and, and work on your events in there. Um, one of the other things is it's, you can use it as a pivot point. For There's another piece of software here called CapMe, and it goes through and it pulls out your, uh, your PCAPs off of your box and then lets you either you know, view them right on the screen as a TCP flow session or as an actual PCAP and pull them into Wireshark, which is what I typically do. Um, and then you can, you can go in and, and do your analysis in, in Wireshark. It's got some neat reports in there. Uh, one of the interesting things is, is so it's got, um, uses uh, HTTPS over port 444. So if you start trying to connect to your box and you're not using port 444, you may have a little frustration there. There is a live demo uh, that is up and running. Uh, the gentleman who created this um, keeps that up and running. When I tried it last night, though, there's a worker process that wasn't running on his box, so it's not that impressive without the worker process. But we'll try it again here after the presentation and see if I can uh, see if that worker process is running this morning or this afternoon. But those are the credentials to get into there. 
So when you first go into, here's your, your Snorby dashboard. So this is first turn up, and this is where I was you know, kind of looking at it here for the first 10 minutes, and I'm not seeing anything even though I'm trying to generate some traffic here. But it'll go through and show you your alerts by severity. So if you're only interested in your high severity alerts, you can drill into that. You can change your time frames as to, to how long you want to look at it for. Um, for each processor core that you give it, it creates its own sensor instance on here. So even though I'm only watching one network, it shows up here as four different interfaces, uh, just for one for each processor on here. So as these lines, and I'll show you an example of that, as these lines start to populate with your event counts on here, um, it doesn't give you a cumulative event count. That's the only thing I don't like about uh, that particular piece here. But it'll go through once you've classified events, it'll give you accounts of all of those. If you have multiple users, it'll show you those. If you're watching multiple different networks on here, it'll show you your, your different networks up here and which ones are the chattiest for your events on there. Uh, but again, I'm watching one network, but it's got four four cores, so there's four instances of snort running on that box. So, as I mentioned, snort is or it's really chatty uh, right out of the box. So this is like 15 minutes into this actually being up and running. Uh, 16,584 events from this sensitive data uh, email addresses. So I go in and I actually look at this signature, and basically it's looking for any clear text protocol, FTP, SMTP, HTTP, and it fires off saying that it thinks it found an email address because you're, you're, you've got some 480 outbound traffic. Well, uh, that's not really useful to me. Um, it's an awful rule. I went through and read, looked at it, and sure enough, there it is. It's looking for those port numbers. And uh, so I disabled that rule. Some of these other event pre-processing rules here are pretty chatty. Most of these start with, with stream 5 up here or HTTP inspect. These are the ones that are usually some type of um, protocol error. So the only one that's up here that's maybe like that I consider legit is this one right here, this ET, merging threats. So most of, again, these summaries you're going to see starting with ET. GNU Linux, APT, uh, user agent outbound. So this was me running the soup script on the box. Uh, so it caught me running updates on the management interface. And what I actually did with this particular rule, and I'll show you how to do this, is I went through and I said, well, I don't care when someone is using that user agent string if the source of it is my security onion management interface, because that's not useful to me. I don't care that I'm running updates on my, my security onion platform. So to disable a rule, there's the path up here um, for your config for that. It uses a standard kind of uh, configuration in here. So these uh, lines that are hashed out here are just comments. And what I do is I just pop in what the actual name of the summary was in here so I know what it was in the future reference. And then you're going to put, um, usually this will be one, the global ID, and then your signature ID. Uh, you can get this information out of Snorby. Uh, so if you start seeing all this stuff, like I run Dropbox at the house, so I really don't care that there's Dropbox activity on my network, or Netflix, or iTunes, or Pandora. I really don't care that that stuff runs on my network, so I just completely disable those rules. So it no longer fires any of these signatures off um, whenever, it's, whenever there's a match on, on those particular signatures. Now there were some other rules that I was interested in still continuing to see, but say from certain subnets or certain specific IPs, I was seeing a lot of false positives, just a whole bunch of junk traffic that I really didn't care about. So you can suppress rules. So there's your path for that. Uh, sample configs, again, these, these hashed out lines or comments. And here's the standard format. So you can say I want to suppress uh, these particular, uh, this particular ID set, which is related to the disabling. <coughs> I want to track it by if the destination IP is always that. So there's the IP of my security onion box right there. So I didn't care when this SSH protocol mismatch came up going to my security onion box. Uh, some other ones that came up here, and again, I just put notes in here. Like uh, if I keep seeing the same alerts come up from the same IP, typically I will try and suppress the alert from just that IP. And then if I notice that it's maybe it's a larger subnet, then I'll go to the subnet before I'll go and just completely disable the rules. So I kind of take this progressive step in actually going through and tuning out these rules. 
So you will you will find over time, uh, you'll do a whole bunch of these right at first when you get this up and running, and then you'll find you'll you'll run some other application that you only use once a month, and you'll see it fire off. There'll be 800 alerts for something on here, and you can go in and then start start. So it's just a you don't ever arrive at it. Just like security in general, it's always a process of going through. Now they may release some new rule that then all of a sudden comes out and just starts creating events left and right on your network as well. So beware of that. So after tuning, we start to see some stuff populate in here. Now all this noise at the very end was me trying to generate some sample traffic. And here it was where I started out with um, some, some tuning things. And as I kind of found some things and started tuning them out, you notice it starts to kind of flatline. So we, let's just ignore the right part of that graph because I know what that is. But here you can see that the Sorby dashboard starts to show you some more information that's useful to you. So this is really where you're going to get kind of the meat and potatoes of your information out of your, your events that happen. And then you can actually go and use some of the other tools in the suite to do analysis on those events if you really want to dig into them. Uh, they also have an iPhone app. Uh, it's a little buggy in that when you go to actually log into it, it gives you these timeout errors about three or four times, but you just tell it OK and log back in again. And eventually, after about three or four times, it'll let you back in here. So it'll go through and actually show you your sample um, sample traffic or your, your alerts in here. And then you can actually click on the alert and, uh, you know, for example, it'll show you like a decap down in here that was associated with that particular alert. Uh, if you want to go through and actually classify this event, so a false positive or some malware activity or something of that nature, you can go through and do your classifications from within here as well. So let's look at some real world examples of, of Security Onion. Uh, I, I like this one. I used to deal with this one quite a bit where I wish I would work for these companies who everyone was local administrator. So malware on your box, local administrator, no more privileges. So uh, you saw on the graph where I was trying to generate some of my own, own sample traffic on there. I kept going through and trying to find some, some little tools and things that I could use to go and, and actually get some of these alerts to fire off on, on here. Now, um, this is a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here today. But in Snort, in your config, there's something called a home net that's real critical to how it works. If you're just using this inside of your own network, it's already set for every RFC 1918 IP, so you're covered there. Uh, now, when I went to actually use this to watch my WAN traffic, I had to modify my home net to my public IP address so that it knew to watch those alerts. Basically, if it's not in the home net, which is usually um, uh, which is usually factored into the way that the, the rule is written, sometimes it's like from any network to any network, or sometimes it's from anything to your home network. Um, it's, it, that is real critical there, but again, if you're just watching it, watching internal traffic on there, uh, the way that it comes out of the box is just fine. So, uh, you know, again, I like to do stuff kind of non-standard ways. I use a little Raspberry Pi, I wrote a bash script on here that just goes through, I kick it off, and it goes through and generates a whole bunch of network traffic that uh, Snort picks up on and, and uh, fires off an event on there. So it's kind of fun to, to do that, just to, just to test it out with. Uh, you can use something like uh, TCP replay. Uh, there's actually some uh, malicious caps that come with Security Onion. So you can put those out here. Uh, ETH1, that's again your, your monitoring interface. You want to throttle it down to 10 megabits there with that switch. But here's just an example. If you go to this uh, op samples, you've got um, a number of PCAPs in there that it will fire off alerts on. Um, and uh, or you can just you can just go through every single one of them, and it'll generate a whole bunch of traffic. It's kind of annoying uh, doing that while you're in actual watching your own network. This is fine to do when you really don't care about what's going on with there, because then you've got to start sorting out what's from your network and what came off of this TCP replay session. So uh, recon example here. Uh, fire up uh, Nmap here, running it against a, a HP laser jet printer is what that is. What that is for. So going through, <laughs> doing the intense scan on them, on the uh, on the printer, and here are the alerts that Snort generated, and this is how they appear in Snorby. 
So we're looking at, we see all of these um, suspicious connections to a bunch of different versions of uh, SQL. Uh, here's, it looks like somebody's scanning for VNC. Uh, and then up here, this one's real interesting. Here's a protocol error here. Um, and then here, up, up top is, we see it says ET scan, so emerging threats, uh, NMAP scripting engine, user agent detected. So it tried to connect over port 80 to this, uh, what is it called, the uh, Jet Direct. And um, it saw the user agent string was, uh, I'll show it to you here in just a second, but we saw 14 instances of that. And so this is kind of what an NMAP scan is going to look like when you see that come up. So this is kind of critical that you understand you run some of this stuff yourself so you know when you see these particular tools used against you, you can kind of identify what's going on. Uh, one scan, was it a standard port scan for this many uh, results? Or uh, I ran the, really the intent scan with NMAP, and so this is what it came up with. So we can kind of see here what, what rules it is watching for. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking for some of these higher ports in here as well that are used by well, VNC, 5900 range, some of these other SQL ports in here. Um, so it kind of depends on what scan was actually run against your asset or assets as to what you're actually going to see and whether it's trying to do things like OS fingerprinting um, as to what it actually picks up. So I mean, it, it can get very verbose with even one single OS yes. scan, right? Yeah. So if you're scanning a whole network and you're you're scanning, you know, every I, or every port on that network range, you might see several pages of events uh, popping up in there. So you might want to exclude and do it? stuff sourced from that box if you're using it to scan your network. Uh, yeah, but that's that's true. But in this case, I was uh, if that was the case, you could suppress it. Yeah. Uh, if you if you had something that was intentionally searching for vulnerabilities or open ports, yeah. misconfigurations internally on your network, you could exclude that box if you knew that that was a legitimate purpose for your network. Um, <coughs> So we're going to look at, once you've got these events up here, you can actually click on these events, and it will expand and show you the information that's behind them. So the um, uh, this is the NMAP scripting uh, engine user agent. And here from the PCAP, you can actually see that. It's kind of hard to see in here, but it's nmap.scripting engine, and then it gives the URL for the NMAP book that talks about, well, it's the purple book from Fyodor. Um, but here it goes through, it gives you that kind of global generator ID, which is generally one, the signature ID. This is the information that you're going to use if you want to suppress this stuff. You can actually go through and view the rule, and it will show you the actual snort rule that it matched off of, so you know what it was that it caught. And then you can compare it to your PCAP down here. If you want to view it, just the ASCII version of it, you can click on that, and it'll show you just the ASCII version of it. Uh, it'll give you all the TCP header information in here, if that's useful to you and part of your IR work. Uh, one neat thing you can do up here is um, for your both your source and your desk. Now, these are both private IPs here, but if one of them is a public IP, you can pivot off of that and look at show me other events uh, that came from, from either that source or destination. And you can also go through and do stuff like a who is off of there. There's another option that's up here. Export or event export options, and that's where you can go up and actually pull this into a PCAP or do a TCP flow view on that, and um, actually take a look at, at everything that's on there. And you can set a time window on there, so hey, I know this source desk IP pair. Show me everything plus or minus an hour uh, from there, for for an example, and uh, and then go through and analyze all that traffic. And then if you you know, suppose somebody downloaded a malicious EXE, you could then follow the TCP stream and Wireshark and then pull that executable out of there, put it up against virus total or whatever you wanted to do with that. Um, you know, it, question on that. Yes, sir. Is that possible because Security Onion is running a full PCAP? Yes. Uh, full PCAP collection? That's correct. Well, normally, you'd only have like a packet or two or three of Right. Uh, so part there. of your, um, the second time you run that setup wizard, it will ask you if you want to do full PCAPs on there, and then ask you for um, of that particular volume how much you want space you want to allocate to it. So I started with a half a terabyte, and I was like, use 90 percent of it. Um, so I do full full PCAPs um, on there. If you've got plenty of drive space, 
I'd say go ahead and do it. Yeah. It'll eventually just overwrite itself anyway. So uh, some of your older stuff may eventually be overwritten and disappear. But um, um, disk space is real cheap. Disk space is not. Disk space is cheap. Any disk space. Yeah, not just, this stuff. You don't have to manage. Yeah, this this is just a local a big circular local, local drive or in this case it's a it's a RAID array. Yes, sir. So with a half a terabyte, has that been enough for your network? Oh yeah. I mean, it was like it doesn't automatically clean up, and by default, and you know, just basically making it more like taking you know your separate ways. Yeah. Once it hits the threshold that you you set it at, and the default is ninety percent, I just accepted the default. Um, it'll it'll do a clean up. I don't know if Security Engine does it, but a good strategy is is to archive any streams that trigger an IDS alert and then let the other stuff age off. So yeah. you can always go back and refer to any TCP session that associated with ID, IDS alert. Right, right. right. Cool. Yeah, because one thing that, that can happen is like, so uh, I've got a couple boxes that are running big SMB shares on my network. If I go start dumping <coughs> data across that, it's getting a peak half of all of that. So if I go move 100 gigs of stuff, well, I just ate up a fifth of my, my drive space on my IDS sensor. So depends on depends on what you're doing. It will take that space if it is detected at something that it wants to flag, right? It's not everything that you copy around. So you mentioned yeah, because it's going that that's going to be mirrored off of your switch. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't maintain PCAP of everything that it sees, yep. or only the malicious things that are. Uh, well, if you set it for full PCAP, it's going to be everything that, that it sees. Okay. Uh, if it's just doing a PCAP and then running it against your signatures in Snort, and it's not a match, it drops it. But I I selected to do a full PCAP. Because the, the thing is, you, you, may, you may see something that fires an alert in here, and there may be other relevant traffic surrounding that, but if you're not doing a full PCAP, you're not going to see that. So I wanted to be able to then see, well, what happened before this? What happened after that? How long do you log on? Uh, well, until it ages off. Um, I know where you're going, but um, uh, yeah, just until it ages off. I, I, I don't do any of it manually. So. Is there a way to like tune the full PCAP component of it? So when I say full PCAP, except for traffic to like this ID. I don't know. So like suppose I wanted to do some kind of remote offsite storage. That you didn't yeah. care about? Clearly I don't want to like record myself sending data out to that. Yeah. So Yeah, like you're using crash plan and it's yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to record that's, all the encrypted traffic. That's a good question. I don't I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> you can tune the, 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 the rules, but the P caps uh, come at a little bit of a lower lower level. Um, that I don't know. So we've got our running scoreboard here. Uh, the, somebody ran the NMAP scan, scan internally against our HP laser jet printer. We were able to detect that, and we caught that. So uh, Snort gives a score of 1. Attackers gives a score of 0. And this is one of my favorite pictures of all times. Uh, they did something similar to this at, at the office where they had the outbound arm was up, but the inbound arm was down. I'm like, uh, so uh, another example here, uh, we already saw the rule where I had tuned out Pandora, but let's suppose you got somebody at your office and you've got a DSL connection and they're sitting there watching Netflix or streaming HBO or, or they're on the Michael Bolton radio channel here jamming out to when a man loves a woman at work and they are just hosing all of your bandwidth. Well, that's something I want to know about. Okay. At lunchtime, it's okay, but outside of the lunch hours, this is just completely unacceptable. Maybe what if they get to show that it improves their productivity? <laughs> well, that's, uh, if that's when you refer them back to the policy and say, I, I, I didn't write the policy. So we see someone up there jamming out to Michael Bolton, and sure enough, here it is. 
uh, again, uh, most of these signatures are going to see an emerging threat. So we see this uh, yes. classifies it as a policy. Emerging threat has a Michael Bolton signature? Yes, it does. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. I didn't know threat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a filter idea. Uh, Michael Bolton uh, streaming audio is considered to be APT malware. <laughs> 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 so the Bobs here want to know about any streaming Michael Bolton coming from, from Pandora. And here it is. Look, we've got our source IP. We know who's doing that. We got them. We're shutting Michael Bolton down for good. So our running scoreboard, Snort, score is two, attackers zero, slackers zero. <laughs> All right, next I ran was the laser shark attack. So I've got the shark with the freaking laser beam on his hand. We have the red snort here. He is the evil snort trying to attack the IDS sensor here. Unfortunately, snort is not a catch-all. IDS is not a band-aid for everything. There's no such thing as a silver bullet, magical does all. <laughs> the vendor tells you that, they're lying to you. Snort did not detect the laser shark attack, unfortunately. So, scoreboard, snort is two, evil snort with a laser shark is one, attacker still zero, slackers still zero. So, here's where I got into the point where, okay, I, I got a good idea of what's going on inside my network. I've kind of tuned everything down, I've seen what's going on, I've had a chance to investigate some of these things, figure out where some of these things are sourcing from or they're, they're going to, and... Uh, you know, found some interesting things out about my network that I thought maybe I knew before, but learned a few things. But I wanted to go through and take a look at what's going on on my outside untrusted interface of my firewall. So I run a Cisco ASA 5505 at home, and you sit there and you just watch that activity light just blinking non-stop, even though you're not doing anything. I wanted to have a good idea of what was going on with that. So I got this Throwing Star Land Tap uh, kit here. Which you can get from Ace Hackware, by the from way. From Ace Hackware. Yeah, yeah. And he will actually get it. Yeah. I've never tried, but you want to buy it. He sells one that's in a box that looks like a generic uh, network gear, so they won't have it. <laughs> So uh, for those of you uh, who, who recognize this from the Cisco ASDM, you'll just see this this nonsense going on just you know all day and night uh, on there. It helps to kind of explain the activity on the outside interface of the firewall. But again, I wanted to take a look at it and know really what was going on there. I want to get in there, rip it apart, and tinker with it. <clears throat> so I pulled out my soldering iron and my my nice fine solder here and started putting this thing together. It took me a couple of minutes. Uh, there's two capacitors on here, which effectively uh, extend the length of your, your cable. Uh, electronically, it does that. And uh, so this will knock down a gigabit connection to fast Ethernet, by the way. Uh, and then you just have your four Ethernet ports that are on here. So eight contacts on the back for each of those, and then two each for the uh, capacitors. And um, again, it took me just a few minutes to put this guy together. And I pop it in line. In between, here's my cable modem. There's my ASO up there. Pop it in line here. So this is going to the cable modem. That's going to my firewall. And here's my tap down here that is going to my uh, ETH1 on my security onion box. Now, you're only connecting one cable, so you're looking at only the inbound traffic. Uh, this is bidirectional. Yeah, but if only if you connect to both ports, right? Mm -hmm. No. No, it's bidirectional. Right. Each individual port is. So you've got a transmit and receive from both of those. You're only reading the transmit. But if if you're running, really, you could do two 200 megabit across that, and you could oversubscribe and monitor port. Theoretically, right. sure. Yeah. <laughs> So once I had this up and running here, I just let it cook here for, for about a half a day and um, went through and started looking at everything that's coming out here that was on my WAN port. Now, I'll save you guys some time. This was my public IP address. It's dynamically assigned. This is no longer my public IP address, so that's why this is 
uh, not obfuscated in any way. So, but so other people are showing so up. All right. So yeah, this is someone else's Comcast public public IP address. Um, and when I made this screenshot, I did not have GeoIP turned on, but I, I do have that turned on here now. I probably should go through and redo this, but it goes through and gives you a little gray box out to the right of each of your IPs here and shows you the country code uh, for, for, what, uh, for each of these sources here. So what I did was I went through all of these and I manually looked them up and kind of tallied them up by, well, what were they looking for and what was the source country on here? But the other thing that you notice, we talked about this uh, a little while ago, was, all right, so this is connecting to MySQL, VNC scan, Microsoft, Postgre, Oracle. Um, I recognize this block here coming in within a one-minute window and all from the same source IP. So I was able to recognize that as that's an NGAP scan as I had done it previously, so I knew once I saw all that come in here, um, this is actually a hosting provider, uh, I forgot which one, but it's a hosting provider here in the U.S. Someone's running an uh, in-map scan uh, against my, uh, my firewall. That was actually Chris Silver. <laughs> <laughs> probably Rob Gray. Probably Rob. Probably so, when I saw those particular events, so here's the one I looked up against the Microsoft uh, attempted China. What do you know? <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> Beijing, China. Huh, how about that? What a shocker that somebody in China is sitting here scanning my network in the middle of the night. I am really, really shocked here. I was not expecting this. So uh, I went through and, and did a look up on every single one of these for the events that I saw uh, coming in through the, uh, the uh, land link here. And I tallied them up. SQL, six, uh, six connections, SSH5, PC Anywhere, two, there must be some good vulnerability there. Uh, proxy connection, uh, port scan, which I, I identified as NMAP. One HTTP connection, and my source countries, we have a winner with China, uh, US, uh, China with nine, US with five, and two from Russia. Uh, most targeted was SQL connections sourcing from, from China. So a giant shocker should be to everybody the, the information that I found here. So our running scoreboard, <laughs> Snort, has detected 18 separate events here for me. Evil Snort with a laser shark, again, IDS is not a cure-all, has one, attacker still zero, slackers still zero. So there's um, a lot of resources that are available um, out here for you. I've already put... Yeah, we talked about this earlier. Firewall, WAF, but no door for your server, server room. That's defense in depth. <laughs> um, I've already put a couple a couple of links in here. Uh, I've got a whole bunch more in here uh, that should be helpful if you actually want to go out and do this. Uh, the Snort documentation just for the Snort engine itself uh, is available here. Uh, it's recommended for new, for new users. Uh, and then there's some additional documentation there, but the actual the manual for it is available to you. Security Onion documentation. There's a whole bunch here. You've got the Project Home, the wiki pages, which I mentioned are a little bit dated, uh, but still may have some useful information about certain file paths and things like that. It uses slightly different file paths than would be if you were just to go and set it up yourself by downloading the individual packages and libraries. Uh, the mailing list that's on here, there's a forum. Uh, the install guide, again, that's the wiki one that's dated. Here's the YouTube link for the recommended way to do it. And when you're inside of Snorby, there is an issue with it that when you try and, um, if you have, uh, like I showed you some of the counts that some of these events had, if you try and do a mass classification on something that, say, had like 800 hits on it, you may have to go back and do it a couple of times to classify the event as maybe false positive or malware or something. Uh, there is a fix for it. It's not included in the package, but you can go through and change the source and, and remake it yourself and, uh, and, and get that, uh, that fixed. So some recommended reading. Uh, I've got a ton of books at home. I like to go out and buy the book and then read about stuff. This is, is, is really dated. But it's, it's good material in general if you're just starting out with looking at setting up a home lab. It talks about snort, talks about snort rules and the way that they're put together. Now, a snort rules presentation is like a week-long session in and of itself. 
uh, but it does talk about that a little bit. Once you go through and start looking at some of those, you'll start to see how they're constructed and what the rule is actually matching on from the traffic that's inside of the decap there. So this one's uh, uh, halfway decent, a little dated, but but still still relevant information. Now this one right here uh, is the book to have if you're going to be doing security onion. So this covers everything in here from the setup, uh, going through and looking at your events, going through and doing your analysis on there. Um, Richard Bailiff book, um, for those of you who know him, uh, this whole book is written around uh, Security Onion. If you're going to buy one of those books, this is the one that I would, would purchase here from No Starch. And if you go to just about any security conference, you'll find No Starch Press there, and they do like 20% discounts on all of your books. That's right. Amazing. Right. I got to say, so most, most security conferences are going to have security conferences. I got to say, so most presenters in DC404 have had the privilege of a fiddle accompaniment, because we were the first ever to have live tap dancing. <laughs> Your presentation was so exciting, you had people oh, dancing yeah, in the aisles. That's correct. Right. That's that's right. 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 Just to be clear, you said click on all the links in your presentation. That's correct. Right. 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 Just blindly. That, that is very, very dangerous. That is very dangerous, so right. 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 do not do this at home. Go to your neighbor's house and do that. That's correct. That's correct. Well, well the, funny, the funny part is, so um, at work, our, our CISO sends out a quarterly, quarterly newsletter, and it is a, a, a PDF attachment. And the last one that we got was like four days after we had to do our required security awareness training about like not opening PDF attachments and clicking on links and stuff. And I was like, is this a test? Am I supposed to forward this back to the CISO and say, enough, is this legitimate? So... I always forward them back and cause all kinds of hate. Forward to the thread. <laughs> well, that's that's yeah. what it. Yeah, right, right. Um, so uh, community helps available here. Um, there is an IRC channel on free node for Security Onion. It's more of like a delayed forum. It's not real active. Uh, you can ask a question and then check back six hours later, and maybe there'll be a response uh, back there. Or a joke about Um. So. Uh, Q and A. Have a question now. Take a picture on next slide. Sack Julia. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. If, if you don't go through and s disable the stuff you don't care about and suppress the stuff that's real chatty, it's a real nightmare to go in and use. Because literally, you'll go to work, you'll come home, and you'll check it, and there'll be pages of alerts in there, and you're just sitting there just selecting them nonstop and saying false positive, false positive, false positive, stuff you don't care about uh, to get to the stuff that you do care about. So it's it's real critical that if you want to actually use this properly, that you're going to go through and, and actually do the tuning on that. And again, it's going to be an ongoing process. One warning about disabling. So the, the pre process, particularly the decoders, are really noisy. Right. Um, a warning about disabling, though, is typically when you see an alert from one of those decoders, it's basically telling you that it's not actually inspecting against the rules. So like if Stream 5 complains about um, you know, small fragments, right. or or uh, HP Inspect is classic. You're saying it had no um, content link right. in the response. Well, that's a hint actually that 
the preprocessor is complaining, but it's not actually matching that traffic against any of the rules. So <laughs> Snort is kind of uh, dumb about evasions. Okay. And so literally, the preprocessor is saying, ah, I don't know what to do with this traffic. Throw a preprocessor alert, but it's actually not going to match any rules. Um, I know that. So, so you would investigate those then? Well, it, it's there's so much of that noise. So like right. we've seen a bunch oh, where yeah. like malformed content types, right. mi missing content links, it's, um, it's unknown HTTP methods, yeah. and basically it just bails on the evaluation, throws a preprocessor decoder alert, and moves along. And if you disable those, there could be a you know some chunk of traffic that's not actually getting matched against your rules. Hmm. But who's got time to investigate all those preprocessor alerts as well? Yeah, they're, 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 it throws so many of those up right. that I, I guess if you got ten guys doing IR work to go look at it, no, sure. The, but the hope is that the endpoint is going to discard it as well because it's not well formed HTTP traffic. But browsers are so liberal with what they accept <laughs> that. Yeah. That it might well be that Snort said, I don't know what to do with this traffic. It hits the browser. The browser happily like figures out something to do with it and gets exported. Right, right. Um, I've got two other projects that I'm working on that hopefully once I get them done, I can, you guys want to see them? Um, so I've been into ham radio for 17 or 18 years now. One thing I, I'm, uh, I want to do with that is a high altitude balloon project where I'm building a uh, basically a Morse code beacon that fits inside of an Altoids can and um, dropping some uh, single strand out of Ethernet cable for a half wave antenna out the bottom of that and send that up in a balloon with a, with a parachute on there and uh, just see what kind of uh, reports that I get back from that. And the other one that I'm working on, but this was this one's quite a bit of fun, is I got some inspiration from the NSA catalog. And <laughs> I've, I've, already, I've already spoken to about some of this stuff, but what, what I'm working on is a droppable, basically remote RF monitor that works with a Raspberry Pi and an SDR uh, that finds um, open wireless and uh, creates a TCP connection back, uh, use some type of SDR software. So I've been working on on that, I still got some, some ways to go on it, but using a Pelican case here, uh, I've got my Raspberry Pi, I've got my SDR here, I've got my wireless adapter, and I have a uh, bulkhead mount SMA connector here, be able to pop this into that case, so you really just see that sticking up out of the top of it, or if you wanted to use uh, a little bit of different antenna, something a little bit more gain, you could certainly do that. Uh, but this basically just finds uh, open, uh, open wireless and um, creates a connection back to a command and control server, and then you can go through and stream your, your RF off of there, tune it, set your bandwidth, and be able to listen to whatever you want to. So if there's something you want to listen to that's maybe a DHF, UHF signal, that's really not going to get out more than half a mile, three quarters of a mile uh, from some location, this would basically let you listen to it wherever you wanted to in the world. So some another little project that I'm working on. And I will keep documenting it as I go along, and if somebody wants to see it, I'll be more than happy to. So if you were, you could do that uh, example of what you could do with that. Um, drop it. Let's say there's a site you're doing surveillance on, and you want to know uh, all the security guards carry this on the UHF radio, and you want to capture all the traffic for a week or so to get an idea of what kind of stuff they're doing, their time frames and schedules. And that would do it for you. Oh, oh, the best part. Would, you know, do that preparatory to breaking in or anything, right? Um, the, the best <laughs> part about it. I don't know. Pen test, right? So the best part about it that I was going to do was take the format that the NSA used for that ant catalog and write like a, a, a sales pitch up for my own one using the NSA format and terminology that they put. <laughs> so. I like it. That was that was my fun one to do. You got to come up with a cool like you know code name for yes, that device yes, as well. Yes, yes, right, right. Yeah. Well, well, I, I like uh, honey badger, so maybe it'll be the honey badger <laughs> project. Well, from if we had mosquito drones, I think some of you might have read about it. Size of a mosquito and then their drones, it's fully operational yeah. robots yeah. with nanotechnology. Awesome. Yeah. Pretty impressive stuff. Any other questions about security on? Yes, sir. So one thing about Snort, um, I uh, so the part uh, I downloaded some Snort rules for that and just put it onto my local rules. But is there like a third party open source for this besides the ones that are already in there for free? There's this there's Snort community rules. I've never used them though. Um, if you were concerned, say about the, the Heartbleed though, if you go to Sands. 
they do have the actual VRT signature, but one of the VRT signatures, there's seven or eight of them up there. Um, the IDS rules for heart bleed are basically looking at the heartbeat response size, and it's set for 200 bytes. Uh, anything over 200 bytes, with which the two byte um, uh, in your in your header, your heartbeat header, you have two bytes that are specified for the the packet size, or not the packet size, um, the response size. So it lets you. That's where you get your 64K. It's a 16-bit number. Um, it's looking for anything 200 or larger. So if somebody was using Heartbleed with 199, it wouldn't catch it. So there's a so VRT has rules that you can get a 30-day delay. You'll be for free. You just have to write this on their website. Um, emerging threats has a free rule set. They also have a professional edition. You have the license for Heartbleed. Uh, the Finnish um, basically Finnish government cert and by whatever uh, published the rules. Um, I think Fox IT, which is a Dutch consulting firm, published the rules, VRTS rules. Most of those rules are shit. Um, and they're going to basically uh, generate false positives all day long. And so, uh, some other tricks about the typing part week, because we spent like a whole week writing some rules for this at SecureWorks. Um, all the proof of concepts will typically, the initial proof of concepts will typically trigger the exploit before the encryption is negotiated. But you can actually send heartbeat requests after the encryption is negotiated. So if you want to be stealthy, um, you know, encrypt the session and then start doing, start reading memory off the server. Um, other stuff, uh, Robert Graham, who's local here in Atlanta, published a tool called Heartbeach, which was meant to embarrass IDS vendors. And so basically, um, all the proof of concepts they just send in one TLS packet a uh, you know, heart, heartbeat request and then get a response back. Instead, you basically intermix multiple TLS records and then put a heartbeat request somewhere in there. And so the snort rules won't work because they were looking for the first record in the mm -hmm. TLS packet to be the heartbeat request. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to get trickier there. Um, what we found is with the encryption, looking for the uh, unusually a small heartbeat request and then a large heartbeat response. Um, the record type is still um, unencrypted before the session you know, goes encrypted, but it's uh, it's not uh, not easy to detect, and there's a lot of ways you can obfuscate it and um, and bypass IDS for that. That makes sense because I tried the uh, nmap nsc script for Heartbleed and download, and it didn't work. We also found like um, from pushing the rules out to our sensor grid that um, heartbeat requests are really common with SSL-based VPNs. Um, so they use that to keep the session alive, even if there's not network traffic going across the VPN. So like, for instance, OpenVPN, um, you're going to see a lot of legitimate heartbeat requests back and forth on that session. So if you're just like, triggering on heartbeat requests, you're going to get flooded by VPN you know, false positives. <coughs> Yeah, the other, the other thing that I've, I've seen a few things on, which were companies that had uh, updated their OpenSSL libraries but neglected to restart the services that depend on those libraries and still <laughs> using the vulnerable, vulnerable version of OpenSSL. So they go through and say, well, I patched it. Well, yeah, you patched the library, but your services are still so using the old library of memory. And then they leave their, their box up and running for another year before they bounce it. The... Um yeah, we also, I think, one of the, maybe the SSL Observatory, one of these big databases that now it's all the search out there, had found some organizations that were like, oh, we need to revoke our certs and we issue certs, but they got a new cert with the same private key they had before. So, uh, <laughs> total fail on the search application there. But I think there's, a, there's an interesting debate around Hot Fleet about whether this was truly, um, how this plays with responsible disclosure, because what actually played out is when Google discovered it, um, they disclosed to a small little, like, they were a friend of yeah. friends. So Cloudflare um, and just a handful of other vendors, they, they approached, approached Nakamai. They didn't tell anybody else. And they said, hey, look, we're being responsible. We told 10 of our buddies. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not clear what the answer is because, you know, once you have 10 people in a circle of trust, it's not a secret anymore, basically. So I don't think they could have kept it, you know, a secret, but... Um, how they should have disclosed it, I'm not sure. But they accelerated the public disclosure once the uh, Code Nomicon guys from Finland found the same bug like a few weeks later, and then they went to 
the Finnish national cert to coordinate the disclosure, at which point they went to open SSL and said, no oh, shit, someone else you know, independently disclosed this. We've got to rush the patches out and, and get, their, get everybody involved. But um, it's not clear that that was really the right decision to just disclose it to the 10 big players out there in the SSL world. I also noticed that Komodo, even if you um, one of the larger uh, SSL certs, uh, signers, um, even if you've got a new key, um, they sign the effective date on the certificate as the same date of the original cell date on the certificate that would be in place. So, you so then no when you check the cert, so you can tell. Cert, yeah. yeah. I guess you could if you compare the cert fingerprint maybe, but yeah, the fingerprint you probably do that because you buy like a 12-month cert.